Forum. Um, I'm joined by the uh, wonderful baritone Robert Rice, who I think is going to be to my uh, left hand side, uh, and also some stay at home choir participants who will be our willing guinea pigs um, for the next 45 minutes. Um, so we are, um, I'm joined by the um, I'm going wonderful to baritone Robert Rice, who I think back. is going to be. There we go, that's better. Um, <laughs> getting a strange deja vu there, hearing myself back. Um, so um, we are wearing two hats this evening. It's the end of our 10 week long armed man project and the very beginning of the Caledonia project, which we are lucky to be working on with Voches 8. Um, so we're gonna be looking at both of those pieces today um, and also um, just exploring some various uh, technique points for good practice when you're singing. Now, this is applicable to sopranos, altos, tenors, basses, anybody just because we have a male voice coach does not mean it's only suitable to male singers as you can see our guinea pigs today are female um so without further ado i'll hand over to robert who's going to introduce himself and then we'll have a little chat through the two pieces of repertoire we've got today thanks very much tori and uh, it's an absolute delight to be with you this evening thank you very much to the stay at home choir for inviting me uh, I'm going to put myself on gallery view so I can keep seeing everybody. I hope that works. And um, so just to give you a bit of an overview of where I'm coming from, I'm coming to you from Camberwell in London, um, but uh, I come from very much a choral background as a singer and uh, as having been a choral scholar in Cambridge, I then um, studied uh, postgraduate singing as a soloist and then became a singing soloist and um, started to teach people especially a lot of people who are involved in choral music and I've continued to do that um, so I teach really people from total beginners uh, up to experienced professional singers um, and I'm interested in the techniques involved in singing choral music and ensemble singing basically. Right. Um, and we've got uh, two pieces we're working on today, um, two movements of the armed man, the Sanctus and the Agnus Dei, um, which we are uh, rehearsing ready for our live sings, which are going to be on the 6th of August as part of the premiere of the armed man. Um, and also Caledonia, which is very different in style, isn't it, Robert, uh, to the armed man? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it does involve uh, thinking rather differently about the, the content of the music and also about how you're going to use your voice. But um, really quite a lot of, of how to approach it is in the, the, the way that you hear it. So um, it's just it's mainly a question of firing the imagination, uh, especially the, the sound imagination, if you like. Well, can you unpack that a little bit more for us? What exactly do you mean when we say imagine sound imagination? Well, um, we the brain is a is is an amazingly kind of versatile thing that we use quite a lot when when we're singing. And um, for example, you can hear um, if you if you think of the sort of singer who would be singing Caledonia, or if you think of how Voces Eight would sound when they were singing it, um, they would probably sound different from how they would they, they would sing a piece by Carl Jenkins. Um, and so there are the uh, actually as soon as we start. Uh, kind of preparing mentally to sing a phrase um we are uh, we're preparing the body as well and so uh, in fact quite a lot of what i do when i'm teaching people to sing is uh, i'm teaching them to develop the connections between how they think and how their body responds so that all becomes and so if you're imagining something and, and you have a sort of strong imaginative sense behind it that's going to change how you then produce the sound I think so. I think it is will we'll change the, the, the sort of tone colour that you can uh, produce. When you think about, for example, how a child would learn to speak, they learn by imitation most of the time. And so that's really, um, that, but, but they're not really aware of the, any kind of technical um, matters. But the, we, we, we simply um, listen to somebody and, and copy it. And that's a lot of what is happening in a, in a singing lesson in a kind of various roundabout ways. Um, so actually the voice is incredibly versatile and what, what we're trying to do I think is unlock the potential of the voice to uh, to respond to the, the, the way that you think. Yeah, um, and 
zooming in on one particular part uh, of the mm. sanctus actually yeah. um, is if you've got your scores guys who are in the room and also on youtube at letter d there's a lot of very loud sustained singing i love it two people have immediately gone up to go and get their scores mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of loud sustained singing now is there a way that we can use our imaginations to to stop us from getting sort of tight and hard on that sound and to keep the uh, the airflow going and the connection moving so that we're singing those long sustained loud passages healthily? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would say that if we're talking about airflow, what we're trying to do when we're addressing a powerful sound is recruit as much of the body as possible into producing the sound so that for example we're not doing what feels like too much work from too close to the voice so that um so if, if we think about power in terms of uh, what you might be doing in sport for example um a weightlifter's kind of power would be very much an upper body kind of thing so you would be activating lots of hands and arms and shoulder muscles um, and rather, when we're thinking about accessing power from a singing point of view, we're doing something quite different. And we're, we're trying perhaps not to use the upper body so much. Um, so your imagination is very useful from the, this point of view because it helps you to access lower breathing muscles rather than upper breathing muscles. Um, and that really that, that will mean that uh, the, your sense of airflow is quite a kind of tall sense or a long sense if you like a kind of tall I've just flow immediately found that I've airflow. just corrected my posture it's like oh tall yeah. sense of airflow Bertie, yeah. Bertie used to teach me back in the day um and uh, I, I, you never forget well with uh, with luck you never forget I mean I think you never forget the sensations if it's been done well if you if, if, if you've been taught well so and we're trying to to kind of get a, a really good map of what the sensations should be um, so you can use that that idea of n not being too sporty in the upper body as a kind of negative idea to say right I'm just going to try and relax this bit and then still breathe nice and freely and that will tend to make the the breathing muscles that are lower lower down in the torso, it will tend to engage them a bit more, I would say. Is there a good exercise that you can just go through with us now for accessing those lower breathing muscles and sort of starting to build that tall, powerful airflow that will give us that healthy, loud sound? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I would say is we could go into a few fricative sounds, for example, and that would be that would be really interesting. Um, so let's just try a sound. Let's just try maybe doing a long F. Here we go. We're going to do it to four. Uh, I'll count you in. Three, four. Great stuff. Let's do a V, the, the same thing, so that but the voice is going to be on. Three, four. V Lovely. So as soon as we have something that uh, is the other end of the vocal folds, it's a little bit kind of, it's, it's, it's the last bit of the tubing, if you like, um, where we've got a little closure there. That allows us really to judge exactly how fast we're sending the, the air and it allows us to judge the evenness of the flow. And that's a, so that's a really nice word. Can I ask, what is it about occluding the vocal tract? What is it mm. about shutting the airflow off with a V or a S or a F yeah. that helps you to um, get in touch with the airflow? What is it about resisting that sound with your mouth that, um, that makes your lower abdominal muscles engage? Well, um, one of the things, of course, is that, that actually the evenness is really is part of it, because um, as soon as you're breathing for an extended period of time, you're much more likely to use the lower breathing muscles. If you're, right. you know, when we're breathing in normal life, uh, we would tend maybe to have collapsed uh, and have to have breathed out entirely after a couple of seconds. And the singing phrase is almost always longer than that, really. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of actually what happens at beat three or beat four is really that that's the crucial thing. So as soon as we've done a, a fricative sound to four beats, we're, we're already, so what, once we've done the, a second exercise that does the same thing, we're already getting into that cycle where the lower breathing muscles are likely to want to join in with the- with, So with you're the kind of waking up a muscle memory. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we can get more and more specific about which muscles these are. But I think it's it's more important to be able to to think just generally a bit lower rather than to to say, right, I have to get this exactly right. We're you know, we're 
just um, everybody's very slightly different. We've, we've all got slightly different breathing styles. We're all slightly different shapes. And that's the, 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 all of that stuff is OK. We've got to use, you know, what use what we're given. You, you kind of start from where we are. See what I mean? Yeah. And you talked about evenness of breath. Now, something else we have to look at in the Arnie Stay is developing a really lovely legato when we're singing quite quietly. We've got mezzo piano, uh, piano dynamics throughout the Arnie Stay. Mm -hmm. and, and I imagine my, my inkling is that mm -hmm. those lower breathing muscles are going to be useful again when it comes to uh, negotiating that different tone color, that different sound. Yes, absolutely. I, I... I would suppose we should we should just define what a, a legato is in a way. Um, it tends to be interpreted, if you ask the examiners, as the words as, as the English word smooth. Um, but really, what it means is linked, linked together. Um, so, if you think of the word ligature, that gives you the um, it gives you the, the sense of meaning. Um, and so, what we want from a really stylish legato, I think, is a sense that. Uh, each syllable is not it doesn't sit on its own um, there is some tone color in common from one syllable to another so that the whole word sounds like a word and then from one word to another so that the, each uh, the set of words sounds like a sentence um, and so that the imagination will help with that because as soon as you think of it as a sentence you're more likely to prepare better you're more likely to get uh, a stronger use of the body and you're more likely to take the, the right amount of breath so those are those are really useful things now i'm going to dive into this a little bit further because yeah. everybody you know legato if you've done some music education in the past hmm. legato equals smooth is something yes. you're going to have heard but let's yeah. just delve into this a little further i'm going to challenge you could you maybe give us an example of saying i don't know uh, a line from something just speaking but in a legato way, and then maybe in a not legato way, we can delve a little deeper into what you mean by marrying tone color between vowels, because that I think is gonna be quite a scary concept for some people. What on earth are we talking about? So maybe we can just delve into that a little more. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, um, a tune that pops into my head is um, The Way You Look Tonight. I don't know hey. why it's popped into my head, but that would be, I think that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Um, so uh, maybe if I sing it in C major, here's my keyboard. Um, I'm just going to take one uh, earphone off so I can hear myself a bit better. <laughs> so um, here's a, a relatively legato version. Someday when I'm awfully low and the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of you. And the way you look tonight. So, thank you. That's um, roughly the. I mean, this is a very classical interpretation uh, of of that piece. And you know, you could get uh, Tony Bennett would probably sing it very differently, and so would Jamie Cullum or whoever. Um, but uh, then, if I, if I were to kind of take some of the legato out of it. Um, I might not sing it with a uniform tone colour anymore. So that would be Someday when I'm awfully low And the world is cold I will feel a glow just thinking of you And actually I find that quite a strain, I have to say. But I was kind of trying to, to differentiate the, um, the, e each syllable quite a lot more in terms of what the, what the uh what the kind of colors of the vowels are if you like um but uh, and i suppose also the result of that was that i i felt like my throat was a bit constricted really that's probably maybe we could ping this over to our uh, our panel of stay at home choir members did, mm. what differences did you guys notice if anybody wants to chime in The non-legato oh, the non was was much more, not bouncy, that's the wrong word, but much more disjointed. A little blocky. Yes. And the legato felt like it was one line and one song. One phrase. Yeah, definitely. Mel. You can do it. There we go. Sorry. 
Um, yeah, it was choppy, and you didn't know where it was going meaning-wise as far as the, mm. the text. Interesting how the line of a phrase can impact on the, how the meaning is communicated. That's a really good point. Thank you. Akko. And the sound of the, the syllables were different. So the placement was different. It was lower or higher, but not like a consistent placement. Definitely. Bertie, could you give us another really bad example just so we can all listen to that? <laughs> yep, yeah, sure. Um, how about, I'll just do this line. I will feel a glow just thinking of you. And I, you could hear me crackle on the of. And that, that I, I have to say, Tori, I'm trying to, to that at the age of 49, I'm trying to find my way out of this uh, idea of demonstrating the bad way of doing it. Okay. Because more and more, more and more often nowadays, I, I find that it's it's helpful to me to demonstrate the good way, and then uh, and, and, and generally when I demonstrate the bad way, I then find it. I, it takes me a few goes to get back to my best when I'm uh, when I'm seeing. All about muscle memory. It's well, very interesting, isn't me. it? And much even as, as the more the I mean the the further on you get, you know, the the more you've practiced it, the the the, the better it's going to be, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I was so I was interested that uh, when I was going up, actually, I found that uh, when I was trying to do it in a disjointed way, my bright vowels, that's roughly the, the E, E, R style vowels, um, they felt like they were getting a little bit nasal, maybe, and a little bit kind of upper teethy. So I was kind of uh, perhaps a bit tighter around there. Um, and my rounder vowels ended up r just stuck in the back of my mouth. Mm. But of course, if you're not employing a sort of consistent airflow mm. and it takes us back to what you were saying about the lower muscles, yeah. then you, you, you sort of have nothing to rely on. You have nothing to, it's, it's less consistent in every way, right? That's absolutely right. I think that the, the, the reason that we want to use these lower muscles is it actually gives us more access to spaces that we're otherwise unaware of. So it tends to make the throat spaces freer. Right. And that means they contribute to the resonance of the voice. Um, it means that and the resonance is really how the air is vibrating internally between here and the, and the vocal folds. We want that whole, that whole space to be very um, uh, quite active in, in sound terms. But the trouble is we don't get very much feedback from the neck. We're not very aware of what our necks are doing. Um, it, it's just a, it, it, it's not kind of pre-programmed into our bodies to do that. So that's why we keep emphasizing feeling tall and stuff like that, because it means you tend to open that, that, that neck space out quite a lot. Um, so uh, yeah, so, and, and, and breathing low um, basically gives us much more access to a, a unrestricted neck space. Could I trouble you for one more ideal demonstration? I'll give it a go. <laughs> no, we'll see. This is the proof of the, the the proof of this pudding is it, whether I can get straight back to the the ideal version. Let's give it a go. Someday when I'm awfully low and the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of you. And the way you look tonight. It's gorgeous. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's lovely to have the opportunity to, to sing at people. We, we don't get that very much, do we, nowadays? Well, you are singing, you're singing to our audience on YouTube as well as our lovely um, willing guinea pig page. Well, what um, a delight. I mean, uh, and it's amazing that there are so many people for, from around the world who are able to tune into this. It's wonderful. One thing I love just listening to you just then is the way that your uh, your lower notes um, in that phrase still had the sort of bright, fizzy quality of your upper notes. Mm. And, and one of the challenges in Caledonia is that our poor bass twos have some very, very low notes to sing. And yeah. um, have you got any tips and tricks and advice for them? I was going to talk about that actually. It's very interesting, kind of looking at it because we do get, especially in this ensemble writing, you get a lot of kind of expectation that the um, the second bass is going to be able to produce a very really lovely low note. And what happens when you're singing in an ensemble actually is that you don't really have to sing those notes very loudly if everybody above you is singing them beautifully in tune. Um, it just it it the ear really picks it up if the tuning is good. It picks up that there's a kind of low, kind of woofy noise going on. Um, I would say that uh, we need to make sure that we're very relaxed when we're singing a low note, 
um, and the, the the vocal folds really going to flap together quite a lot. So that with, with the in any sense that we're kind of pulling the voice around is definitely to be avoided. Mm. Um, sometimes you can get uh, you 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 may find that if there's if there's one note that you can't that isn't really in your range, you can kind of achieve it by adding a little bit of pressure. But I would not recommend that you do that for very long. So that sometimes, you know, if I've got, I mean, about G is, but it's probably about my lowest note at the moment. So I go kind of la 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 la, and if I add some pressure, la 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 la, but and there, there I absolutely conk out. So we got to cut. So I got to, to about an E natural there. But if I take the the technique with which I sang that E natural and the kind of, and the a slight push about it, and apply that to all the notes above it again. Um, so it kind of it becomes part of my muscle memory, then I really will be in trouble technically. Um, so I would say that if you do find your, that if you do notice yourself applying a bit of downward pressure on the voice, if you feel your neck is getting tense, your jaw is getting tense, your tongue, then um, try to release that on the next in breath, and then just go back to the natural way that you would normally f kind of find your your voice working. And uh, this also applies to altos who are singing low. And being and having to be speaky, if you like, and indeed sopranos would sing low because sometimes sopranos have got to mix a bit of chest in the uh, to sing a low B, for example, um, in the, and that will happen in this piece too, um, especially in this style and this kind of more folky style. Yeah, you've just said one of the stay-at-home choir's favourite words, and that is release. Mm, um, right. For those people who are joining us for this project, could you just give us a little lowdown of what you mean when you say release? What are we releasing? Are we releasing the hounds? Are we releasing a, <laughs> a, a flock of doves? What what are we yeah. releasing? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, really, it's the whole respiratory system it, uh, is involved in a kind of release. Um, what happens in normal life, I would say, is that uh, this varies a bit from person to person, but we tend to breathe out. And then the 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 uh, breathe back in again, and there there is a kind of natural recoil that kind of allows these things to to happen, but that's very much to do with um, perhaps if you like a kind of if it's like a kind of balloon floating or something like that. When we're singing a phrase like we did we did our F and our V for example, and then I did my um, singing of the um, the Jerome Kern, um, the I will feel like a lot just thinking of you. And what I need to happen at that point, you and is the freest and quickest breath I can I can do. So what is releasing at that point? Well, there is a lot there, a lot of release will be going on in this area here. Excuse me showing you my abdomen, but this this is the useful bit. So here's my breastbone, and then I get get down to there, and that's the, the top of my abdomen, and I want this to be as flexible as possible. Um, if I don't release this, you and can you see these bits go up here instead? You and and I don't really want that to go that fast. I don't want my rib cage to go very fast, really. So I want all of my fast movement of breath, you to happen this way. You and the way you look tonight. So that's a good place to try to concentrate on. I do have a couple of pupils who are not that not that happy thinking about their tummies because uh, for for various reasons they get they they get a bit agitated some some um people are a bit, it makes people feel a bit scared sometimes. Um it's a, only you know a small percentage of people but um if that is you then I would generally think out into the room when you get to the end of a phrase so that you can kind of sense how you've projected your sound as if it's kind of moving away from you. And that will keep this area quite open, I would say, mm -hmm. so that the you can, in fact, get quite a lot of these things to happen indirectly. You don't necessarily have to think directly at your tummy. You can really pretty much anything that goes down the middle of the body, anything on this midline here is a good, good place to start if you're trying to get get some release to happen, mm -hmm. kind of the jaw or the this bit here, just to open your mouth when you breathe in. It, it, pretty much all of those things will do something. The bit ideas. I think we would, I'd really like to practice this on is mm. bar 32 through to 37-ish of the Sanctus in the mm. arm plan. Now, if you're a Caledonia singer, 
this is still going to be applicable to you. This is just a particularly useful area to look at how we're releasing the breath, particularly looking for the sopranos. Um, so if you're an alto, maybe join in on the soprano line for this, just to get that sensation of, of, of what a good quaver release looks like. It's on page 35 of the Sanctus. Mm -hmm. Do the bit I mean. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got to get up by, by just over an octave on the, in bar 32. Is that right? Yeah, you but uh, then actually I'm thinking of the quaver releases sort of 33, 34. Yeah. Gloria, Gloria. Yeah, absolutely. And that so that that note that on the third beat has to be quite uh, defined and then you've got to get get some release in. So while you're doing a long note here, it would be good to think about the speed at which you've got to go at the re during the rest of the bar. Um so don't don't get stuck in in thinking about um half notes, minims. Um we want to we want to think about um eighth notes, quavers. Um so that we've got that sense of how that uh, that that speed will be. See what I mean? Should we try a bit of that? Do you think? That would be brilliant. Yes. Okay. So, well, what about that? Um, so, shall we just go? Should we just go straight in at Gloria? Is it about that speed? Let's just try that. Um, Sorry, uh, it's a little bit more stately than that. Ya -da -dee -da. Yeah. Okay. Great. So it, here it is. There's a there's a starting note. Let's give it a go. One two, three. Okay, so um, of course everybody's muted there, so I don't get any sense of it. So you're going to have to feed back to me what, what your sense was of seeing those bars. Feel free to just unmute yourself guys and chime in. As in, uh, with how it felt, rather than actually singing it. Um, Hi. Hi. I felt that actually this was not the most difficult part of the piece. I mean, mm. maybe that's ignorance is bliss. Um, because you do actually get a written in quaver in which to release and take your breath. Yep. It's not like other places where you're thinking, heavens above, where am I going to breathe in all this lot? Mm. You know, so um, it's... It, it's not been the most difficult part of it for me um, because of the, the good writing. <laughs> yes, so absolutely. What other people think. Uh, one of the issues when there isn't a, a, a written in rest, of course, is where do you put your consonant? And that's, re that's really important. But of course, if it's, uh, uh, we're trying to get everybody, of course, to represent the piece as closely as possible, I guess. Mm -hmm. But if you were singing together as a choir, you would probably cheat quite a lot. Um, so, <laughs> you know, somebody would do the consonant and somebody would, t would take the breath and then the next bar, you'd do the opposite and you'd swap. There, mm -hmm. So there would be, be quite a lot of um, staggered breathing and all sorts of things like that. The, you where, can still do that. You, can uh, still you do just that. have to imagine your colleagues around you rather than being able to hear them. Mm. This is where, where we come back to the imagination. Sorry, it's embarrassing though when you send in your recordings <laughs> because you feel, oh dear me, you know, all these breaths I'm taking in the wrong places and so on, whereas you get away with it in a choir. You're oh, much you more exposed. You're much recordings. more exposed. Hmm? You should hear some of my recordings. I have no <laughs> shame, no shame in taking lots of breaths. Well, I'd rather, I have more pride in the, qual in the tone quality of my voice than I do in the length of my phrases. But actually, that's that's not necessarily true. Um, you you can take a breath without breaking the phrase mentally. So I'm not necessarily being true here. Maybe I need to choose my words more carefully. I'm I'm more concerned with preserving the quality, the tone quality of my voice than I am with how long I can keep the breath going before I need to breathe. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, that's, that's why it's more good point. creativity yes, yes. and art and beauty. Yes, Hi, Sue. Yes. Hi. Um, I mean, I know, obviously, we, we are doing staggered breathing in, in a real choir situation, but I guess we're going to have to deal with virtual choirs for quite a long time. Um, but when you come round to doing your audio, you know, putting all the audios together, I guess it's not going to show if if I run out of breath because of the, the technical wizardry that you're going to do in the background to stitch it all together, you know. Exciting. That was fun. Um, it's absolutely not going to show, and uh, really, what would show, I think, is if our if if everybody's sound suffered uh, at the same point because we're all trying to get through uh, the same length of phrase together, 
then that would be much more of a problem, I would say. So actually, a bit of intelligent staggering is a, a, a really good idea. And it's quite interesting also, I mean, sometimes it's possible to do staggered breathing even in an ensemble where you're singing one to a part, um, because your note might be covered at exactly the same pitch um, by somebody else, at which point, if you can agree that only one of you is going to sing it, then you've got a, you've got a whole note to breathe. And that can be a very, a very lovely shared experience. Um, I must say, having done this for a few months now, um, the way you approach staggered breathing shouldn't be any different from being in a virtual choir than being in a real choir. Um, mm. And that's actually not because of the technical wizardry. It's actually just because the effect of laying lots of voices over each other has the same audio effect as it would if the voices were all sounding together because they were physically in the same space. So actually it's not the technical wizardry that's saving you here, it's your colleagues in the choir. I would also say that I, I don't think anybody should be embarrassed about or needs to be embarrassed about just showing up with their skills. Um, yeah. You know, it's that that is especially a lockdown thing that, you know, because we're, we're all this is a great opportunity to try out things that we might never have done before. Um, uh, and also, uh, you know, th music is very much about that. We don't we don't want it to be a, um, a, a, a kind of a, a, a closed off an ivory tower experience at all. It's um, it, it, it's for everybody. And that's what I love about these arrangements, because you get this sense that you're sharing something uh, with people who are you know doing it all the time and and enjoying singing for their for their for their living or at least they would be um if we were they're getting back to it though aren't they because um, yeah. some of these uh, groups are starting to do performances i noticed the swingles were were, were doing one um, we've got one on saturday yeah wonderful you can still get your tickets now um, yes, absolutely. So um, as with anything, if any of the technical terms here have been a little bit scary and you're like, what were they saying? Just ask us. We're really friendly. We want to make this accessible and open to everybody so we can all learn together. So do ask us either on social media, on Twitter. You can email us. It's contact at stayathomechoir.com. Um, and you can find all of the information on the website as well. Um, now, we've got some wonderful questions that have been submitted by you, our panellists. Um, Robert, would you like to choose the first one? Yes, absolutely. So, um, Janet, is, let's just check that Janet is actually here. Uh, so, that's you. Yeah, hi. Okay, good. So, hi. Janet, you've asked us, well, actually, do, um, do you want to paraphrase what you've asked us? Uh, yeah, although you actually seem to address it right at the beginning, which I thought okay. was very interesting. It's about it's about approaching the different genre because we're looking here at something like the Sanctus Nianus Dei, which is radically different from then moving on as a singer to Caledonia. Mm, and my yeah, question yeah. was, um, when you're doing that as a singer, is it just about mentally thinking and emotionally thinking this is a different genre of music or are there technical things that you need to do changing genre so you've got the best voice for each type of music but you did you actually ticked a lot of those boxes for me with what you said when we started the session that's good to hear janet but i would say it's a really good question um and it does bear a little bit more um investigation um I think probably uh, in folk styles and probably in music theatre styles as well, theatrical singing styles, uh, what we tend to have is a bit more primacy of the syllable and the word um, so that we're not quite so focused on making a pure legato um, with, a, with a kind of lovely consistency of tone. The words seem to be a little bit more extemporary, a little bit more fresh. Um, and so we perhaps we kind of try to get people a bit more interested in exactly what we're saying right now. But that would be if you were singing the, 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 the solo line, and of course that's taken by Voces at the beginning of, uh, the, of, of this piece, but I'm just going to put it up here. Um, then the stay at home class starts singing words. Um, and I think in, a, in an ensemble piece like this, uh, it depends whether you're singing the tune or not. If you're not singing the tune, um, and you can tell you're not singing the tune, if you if if if, if it's clear that the tune is somewhere else, um, then probably the way that you pronounce the words will not be hyper. It won't be very. It won't be really strong. It will be 
gentle and joining in with, with, with everybody else. You kind of think of yourself as making, if you like, an accompanying tone. Uh, probably the, the imagination will will help that to some extent but it's good to be aware to have your kind of your aware awareness of what your part does within the whole mm. so that's another thing that's happening in 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 this piece um and the other thing that you can think about is uh, would you be singing it with an accent and if so what i think with the armed man we're singing it's kind of latin at syllables so we might be a bit closer to how um an italian would pronounce those syllables that's that's usually quite a touchstone for those uh that for those texts and of course here we're singing in Caledonia. Glaswegian. the glaswegian right exactly so mm-hmm. have it, ha, ha, has the choir actually specified a, a a an accent with which it's to be sung or is it just you're, you're using your natural no i'm just i'm just being silly um yeah. but um we they have been talking what you say have been talking about a lighter slightly breathier tone actually mm. um than you might be used to if you're singing quite you know uh, traditional classical music yeah not so much say, accent. And that, that, that that's very that would be very consistent with um the with the an ensemble's way of doing a folk song or a pop song or something like that um they, they'll be very used to producing that sort of tone color it is worth saying that it's possible to produce a breathy tone without shutting your throat so you could it's de- definitely worth re- kind of reminding yourself to stay as released as possible in your in breath and then if you end up using a little bit more air um, and the, so the airflow feels like it's going a bit faster in order to produce a slightly breathier sound quality yeah. then um, that would be helpful for this particular piece but as long as you do it with some of the technical things we've been talking about in mind and then I as we always say happy. if it doesn't feel comfortable the mm. chances are it's not very healthy yeah absolutely. if it doesn't feel comfortable don't do it yeah yeah absolutely stay on the side or on the safe side as it were um, yeah. with, with that should we do another question, Tori? Yeah, let's. Um, I'm going to go to um, I'm going to go to Sue. Sue White, would you like to ask your question? I will. Um, yeah, my question was how to deal with nerves, I guess, mm. when singing. I was quite staggered to find that I got quite nervous um, singing to myself, or you know, um, recording and uploading and actually listening to it and thinking, oh my God, it sounds so reedy and awful. (laughs) I'm really pleased you asked this question because um, I I was having similar issues myself with it at the beginning of of, um, lockdown. The first thing I was asked to to contribute to was a a recording of The Bluebird by Stanford. And this is a piece that you can cheat uh, as a bass quite easily if you've got three other basses around you, um, because you can take it take it in turns. But it's 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 very low and it's got these very very long phrases, re- really sustained, quite quite tricky. And I found it really difficult to get one whole take that I was I was happy with. Um, and uh, I think of course it's a bit a little bit mood dependent, and we have to make sure that we've got enough patience with ourselves. And that's just generally something I encourage all my singing pupils to do is to cut ourselves enough slack to be able to return and give it another go um, because it is cyclical and we learn as we go and we should give ourselves the opportunity to do that and generally my tips for performance anxiety are um, it's good actually if we're talking about anxiety it's it's good to take as many tips from as many people as you can because there's lots of information around there are lots of excellent self-help books about it it's a great book by the way by um Barry Green and Tim Galway called The Inner Game of Music. It's quite involved, but it's really, really interesting. And it's about how not to get in your own way. Um, And uh, I certainly found that really useful when I was a young pro. Um, But uh, so my, my main tips are make sure you've got a sense of the space around you so you can feel your grounding. Generally, if we're feeling over, uh, uh, kind of hyper, more anxious, then our focus will come in. So uh, in my experience, I think um, to add some sense of perspective will help. And that helps us because we, we want everything to be free in the midline of the body so that we want to be able to to uh, find our most helpful height uh, to be using the voice. So think of the space around you. I say to people um, that uh, you've, you're in the middle of the stage and that means that there's lots of room behind you too and lots of room at the sides. That's what you're thinking of. And then uh, just remember that the breath is definitely going to flow. So we want to make sure that it, that it is, it's a long flow of breath. Um, and get into the music. 
is the third thing so that if you find that that you're kind of worried about your singing of the music it's worth just thinking about the the result and the meaning and usually thinking about the meaning helps us to access our, our best tone color remember you don't hear yourself very well inside your own head so you're going to be a bit startled by the way you sound and that's okay i think we're we're allowed to work towards accepting what what we sound like on the outside does it we all got kind of thrown into this business where we have where we're recording ourselves but quite precipitately and um you know cut ourselves enough slack just to be able to stay Absolutely. with the project yeah you are enough mm. um uh, if you're watching on youtube just comment in the chats if you've got any other questions or you've got anything to add um to what we're talking about i have a feeling that what sue's just said will resonate with a lot of people and um, maybe if you're on the screen and you you felt a little bit nervous or a little bit um shocked when you heard your voice back for the first time maybe give me a nod or a jazz hand or something because i know i certainly did and um, so you are not alone um but you know we're all in this together and the wonderful thing about it is that even though you can't hear your colleagues they are there and they will be there on the night um so yes uh, just you know if if you if you're not having a good day with recording the wonderful thing about recording rather than having a one shot only uh concert performance is that you can give up and you can try again the next day you can be kind to yourself cut yourself a bit of slack come back when things are feeling slightly more comfortable or you know you've got a little bit more resolve to to really give it a go um and actually being able to hear just your own voice um, not that i'm advocating listening to your own voice um but it gives you a a, a more sort of folk ability to focus in more on how your setup is going. You can think about how am I standing? How does it feel? You can really focus on taking care of yourself, your body as an instrument, um, because you've got no other distractions. So it can actually be a really lovely chance to get in touch with your own voice and to learn more about it as an instrument. I would say you had, you, we're looking to teach ourselves as much as possible within this process as well. Yeah. So just uh, you could imagine if you were teaching somebody else, you would probably be, be very encouraging. And that would be the first thing uh, that would come to mind. And then from there, you could that, that opens up enough space where you can start to uh, suggest uh, uh, things to think about that, that can help build on that, on what you're already doing to help improve it. That's yeah. the way to think about it for, for yourself as well. Great. Bertie, would you like to pick our next question? Yeah, certainly I would. Uh, I'd love to hear from, um, is that Marie or Maria? Uh, Marie, I think. Um, tips, it hints in, in, into incorporating into the final performance, good breathing, posture, attack, legato, and all the wonderful advice we've been given. I think so, to, in a very large extent, you've answered it from um, what you were saying to Sue, because, um, you know, Sue is saying about nerves, and that, that's hmm. probably the base you know the, the crux of the matter that um, we have all these wonderful technical forums and some rehearsals and we learn about breathing and you know going for the high notes and all this mm. and oh it's wonderful you said and then you try to put it all together and yes. you're just so concerned with getting to the end of the piece or the end of the phrase or whatever mm. it all mm. goes out of the window um, I, I think we've all been there. I think um, when there are too there are too many distracting factors, or too, there's there's too much going on, and we find that we can't give what we consider to be our very best at the time. But actually, I, I've always felt when this is true of live performance as well that the work mm -hmm. that I'm doing now does not really have an effect on the gig I do at the weekend. Um, it, well, I mean, it does to some extent because it means that I'm kind of feeling a little bit more attuned to. Uh, uh, my voice is kind of ready to do the things I, I, I want it to do because I've be, been thinking about it enough. But mm -hmm. usually the technical work that you might be doing at the moment is really good for six months time. What's really good for a year's time. And I, I think that's OK, too. Um, so really, and, and what we want to boil it down to in a uh, when we're preparing for our performance is maybe one keyword that we can think about. Um, so I'm just going to remember to release each time. Um, and that kind of the, w w when there's a lot of music to read, it's re it's it's really crucial to do that. I think reading tends to put us in a very specific part of our minds as well. It puts us in the in the the kind of educative bit where we tend to get on our own cases a, a, a bit too much as well. So actually, you know, um, don't forget to read the music as well, and that uh, the, you know read the shapes of the notes, and get mm -hmm. it into a really kind of phrasey place. 
Yeah, when you get to the performance point, you know, you've done your best, you've learnt as much as you can. And the point of a performance is to enjoy yourself and to communicate um, and to make something beautiful. So, you know, if it doesn't all, if you don't implement everything you've learned, there's always next time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great face Bertie I wish I had a screenshot of that <laughs> and now we're officially out of time but we've got three more questions from people on our screens so maybe we could just whiz round really quickly uh, and I'm going to go to Arco first Arco Ako Ako yeah thank Arco. you uh, my question is um, after a long rehearsal or a long recording session these days um, the voice gets audibly tired. So is there some technique to avoid this fatigue in the voice? Um, I would say that these issues of uh, vocal resilience, if you like, are um, quite individual. So it would really, it depends a bit from one person to another. I think it would be interesting, um, for, I would generally uh, advise anybody who, who has vocal tiredness to uh, consider not just the way that they're singing, but also the way that they're speaking, because there may well be um, elements of uh, the, the speech use that creep into the singing as well. And often um, the tiredness would be to do with constricting uh, or um, the activation of the back of the tongue, which tend to be roughly the same thing. So often when we do movements that make the front of the tongue move around a lot, then we te the back of the tongue tends to calm down and stay in a little, slightly more consistent position. And it doesn't set off our muscles that, that um, make us swallow. And so that makes, and they tend to be the tightening ones in the throat. So often uh, if you, for example, I, um, I think I, I did a little video for the Stay At Home Choir a, a few weeks ago, and I just gave three consonants that are kind of worth doing. You can do them silently and they're G, L and Y. So if it lets us just all go la, 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 la. Ga 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 ga. Yeah 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 yeah. And we're trying to do those without really moving the jaw up and down too much. And then if we do them silently, then that gets the the, the the tongue on the move within the mouth space. And and I would particularly try that yeah 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 without moving your jaw too far. Yeah 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 yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, 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 it, that that exercise is the foundation of a, a, an awful lot of things in singing. If you can, um, if you can kind of keep singing an R while you're singing a Y, then your throat is likely to be open because it it opens to facilitate that. Mm. That's really the foundation of our legato. That um, the vowel is part of the vowel is possible while the consonant is happening. Mm. Great. Well, very very quickly, can we go to Kathleen and then to Mel? Yeah, hi. Um, you kind of often hear about singing in your chest voice and singing in your head voice. Um, so I suppose my question is, is it is it the lower notes that are from the chest and the higher notes, you know, um, that are in the head? Um, is there a, a way of transitioning between the two um, smoothly? Um, so it's a really yeah. great question and it's a very um it's quite a long question to answer but i would say that if we're uh, basically these designations of chest and head voice are quite subjective um they are there there are technical reasons why sometimes we feel more vibration in the chest and sometimes we feel more vibration in the head um and that is uh, that can sometimes be to do with how high or low the note is but there are certain notes where it's possible to feel both and certain ways of singing in which it's possible to feel both. So um, if we're talking about classical style, we practice our transition usually from the upper notes downwards um, for treble voices, female voices, um, sopranos, altos, mezzo-sopranos, countertenors. Um, so, so that's that's what we were trying to do. And we we're trying to make the, the, the way that the voice operates and resonates as consistent as possible. 
Um, and then one thing that you can do to kind of uh, that, that helps the transition. And one thing you can do in the tricky bit where you're not sure whether you're whether you're supposed to be in chest or head voice is to stop and come back in again. So you so do things like that sort of thing. That's what I, I sometimes make my, my, my pupils do. Um, and the if you were singing in more folk styles and you wanted to build up your chest tone, then you would probably do something more likely from, from the other direction or something a bit more balanced between those two approaches. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and and uh, just we will be going into more detail and breaking this down more over the course of the rehearsals for Caledonia. And um, when uh, uh, Vodges eight, I think Katie talked about the mask of the face. Um, that is all to do with where you're placing the vowels, and that's going to make a difference to how it feels, where it resonates, all of this stuff. But don't ever forget that you're singing always. That you're always making the sound in your larynx. You know, as much as people say chest, head, you know, you don't have a tiny little larynx in your forehead that's going. <laughs> and if you keep yourself grounded and you don't forget the, phys the, the physiology of where your singing comes from, then it's much more easy to be like, oh, well, this is vibrating here, but also here. Um, and, you know, it all becomes a little bit looser and like Robert said, um, <laughs> less clear cut and therefore sometimes easier to cope with. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And finally, we have a question about ooh. And a sticky mute button by the looks of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, in Caledonia, we have a lot of oohs and ahs and ums um, that extend for several bars. And I was kind of wondering um, if there's any technique of um, Aside from maybe uh, just the dynamics, if they're phrasing or uh, to give it meaning and expression while we're still background. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I mean, there are there are lots of ways to still tap into expressivity even when you're doing something that is quite um, it's quite kind of blockish or solid. Um, one thing is to uh, to know what the tune is that is happening, know what the words are that are, are happening, and maybe to kind of if if you maybe do a tiny little unless you've been asked to make it kind of completely nuanceless yeah generally we wouldn't ask that um, but just you could do a tiny little kind of um tiny little swell to the what feels like the, the higher point of the phrase and back again i think that's mm -hmm. that's perfectly permissible within an accompanying tone um sometimes actually that you you can tell that from how the harmony works because you can you can sense oh this is a gooey bit coming up so actually i'm just going to crescendo my line even though I can only hear my line, um, so that I, I know that other people will do the same thing and they'll kind of coalesce and we'll have a nice clash there, that sort of thing. Generally, um, the technical way of humming uh, is it's quite important that when you close your mouth, you don't close everything else behind it and underneath it as well, so that we don't we don't make a fully constricted sound when we hum. Mm, that would be fully constricted. Mm, that would be a freer hum. And I'm kind of giving myself space to sing a vowel, even though I'm not. If you see what I mean, so it's it, it's good to practice going from a vowel to a hum and back again, um, 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 uh, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and the same thing applies to an ooh because it's quite a it's quite a small sound, a, a small uh, aperture at the front. Quite often people use that for an ooh, ooh. That doesn't mean we have to shut everything else off in the rest of the tubing. So we sometimes sing it like an ooh with an ooh fronting or something like that. It gets a bit more technical, but you know if your intention is to cheat a bit of an open throat into everything, then you're doing well. Yeah. And what you said about um, uh, being aware of the text in order to inform how you're singing your uh, sort of unvoy, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Your vowel yeah, yeah. sound or your hum or your- Yeah, your, your, your nonverbal uh, sound, if you like, yeah. yeah. Brings us right back full circle to where we were right at the start of this technique forum, which was how imagination can inform your singing and your sound. Um, and, uh, and I think that is such an important thing to take away from this session is that how you're engaging with the music and how you're engaging with what other people are singing is really going to shape how you sing. And it's particularly important with those ums and oohs and ahs. I'd absolutely agree with that. Don't think that it's it's just a background sound so it doesn't matter. It's kind of almost the opposite of that. People are always going to tune in. The listener is always going to tune in to a a, 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 um, a 
kind of verbalized in a, a, the, the, the actual tune of the song. Um, but uh, we need to be able to have a really lovely, consistent background sound. So we have to take care of it and cherish it. Brilliant. Well, there we go. We've come full circle, right the way back to imagination. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Robert Rice, thank you so much for giving us your time and your expertise. And in the stay at home choir manner, we give a double jazz hand to say thank you. Um, and My I did hope that you might pop in on another rehearsal and say hi, or certainly uh, join us for the Armed Man premiere. On this. Yeah, I'd love to hear how it's all going. And uh, thanks so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you. Thanks very much to our forum and um, good luck with everything, with all your projects. Thank you. Um, and uh, goodbye to everybody watching on YouTube. We'll see you in a rehearsal very soon.